Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's show. And if you are joining for the first time, this is part of our digital transformation series for which we meet every Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. Our goal is going to be to pick one topic related to digital transformation. And we have one exciting panel always for you every week that is willing to share their insights and wisdom. For today, we are going to be talking about marketing information architecture. And you guys might be wondering that, you know, when you talk about information architecture, you don't really hear marketing word, uh, you know, associated with that. But today we are going to be approaching this very differently. We are going to be talking about the user personas of the marketing department. We are going to be talking about their interactions and need as far as their system needs goes. And if that needs to be part of the enterprise architecture. Before we do all of that, we are going to start with everybody's intros. Dave, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Sam. My name is Dave Chrysler, and I own an operations consulting business working with owners in the manufacturing, construction, and cannabis spaces to help them create the systems they need to reclaim their life and grow their business. And I come to you today with more than 20 years in the manufacturing space, directly related and responsible for operations. So excited to be here with you today, Sam and everybody. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Dave. Uh, Ken, can I move to you next for your intro? Absolutely. Thanks, Sam. My name is Ken Novak. I'm the owner of Hatch Quantified. Help organizations digitally transform by correlating digital investment to financial KPIs. Uh, have a 20 plus year history, um, ranging consulting through ops acceleration within a Fortune 500 manufacturing company. Uh, expertise ranges from e-commerce to anything search related, um, all the way through CX experiences. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Ken. And Rick, you are joining for the first time. Can I ask you to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Rick Watson, and uh, uh, I've been an e-commerce entrepreneur and operator for the past 20 years uh, my consulting firm is RMW Commerce. And the problem I solve is a lot of people invest in a lot of big technology solutions and aren't able to leverage them to the maximum potential. And so as a result, they have, what they have is a lot of shelfware uh, rather than being able to uh, reach customers most efficiently. It's going to be so awesome discussing all of that. Thank you so much, Rick, for being here. Sarah, can I ask you to introduce yourself next? Absolutely. Howdy from Austin. I'm actually in a brand new job in a brand new state and I'm practicing my howdies and y'alls. So my name is Sarah Scudder. I am the chief marketing officer at a software company called Source Day. And if it isn't obvious enough, our color is green, hence our green walls almost everywhere in the office. But I think I bring a really unique perspective because I have done a lot of work in the marketing procurement space. So working between marketing and procurement to help them assess and buy and implement technology solutions. And now as a chief marketing officer, I'm actually in the day to day working with technologies and systems and really getting a sense of what is and isn't working. And I love to collaborate with Sarah all the time as well, just because she brings so unique perspective. It's going to be so much fun. Thank you so much for being here, Sarah. All right, Robert, can I move to you next for your introduction? Sure. My name is Robert Brown. Um, my company is Robert Brown E-Commerce Consultancy. I focus on the data processes and technology that drive profits for your company. I come from a background of Fortune 100, Fortune 50 companies. Um, Big systems, lots of people, lots of processes, and I'm taking that knowledge and bringing it down to the small and medium-sized business to help them be more efficient and help them grow to the next stage. All right, amazing. Thank you so much, uh, Robert, for that. So now, as you guys know, Dave, you know, I love stories, okay? So we are going to be starting with these stories, and today, the story is going to be slightly different because we are going to be talking about the technical architecture in the story. Can you believe this, okay? So you are going to pick a story of your engagement that you have worked on, and we are going to be talking about the marketing perspective of that business, how many different uh, you know systems it had, uh, what kind of uh, marketing roles were there in that story, and how was the interaction with the enterprise layer? 
so Dave, I am actually going to start with you and then I'm going to follow up with everybody else. Uh, you can address the comments from the previous uh, speaker or you can uh, speak about your story. Dave, do you wanna start? Sure, thanks, Sam. Uh, I will tell the story of a print manufacturing company uh, that I have worked with in the past. And in this particular instance, from a marketing architecture standpoint, uh, they were utilizing uh, one platform to handle their email marketing, uh, text marketing. Uh, and then that platform was also connected into uh, their CRM and also their ERP system. Um, so in that particular case, uh, from an architecture standpoint, they also had access to a centralized database, centralized server to store marketing assets, uh, which was segregated from some of the other file share, uh, storage that they had as well. Um, I'm trying to think here. Uh, so in terms of, uh, in terms of, how that interaction ultimately ended up working. Uh, obviously, the marketing side of things was driving the inbound. And because of how they had those systems connected, they had the ability to then uh, log an entry, if you will, into their CRM for their sales team to be able to monitor. Uh, and in this case, they had both inside sales and external sales. So it was kind of a, um, a double teamed approach there. So they could actually identify kind of where that client or customer was at in the process and uh, be able to send additional resources when they hit certain metrics kind of throughout that journey. Um, and so, you know, yeah, I, I, I think, I think I'm going to wrap up there for right now. That's okay. what I'm going to do. So, uh, yeah, so I'm actually going to have one follow-up question, if you don't mind, and that is yeah. always going to be related to, uh, you know, process boundaries, because in my experience, when we talk about these roles, uh, the systems, one problem always is going to be uh, in identifying, okay, where do I stop and where you are going to start as the next person? And that is probably the classic conflict between sales and marketing, marketing customer service. Uh, and we are going to be touching a lot on that, how to create the KPI so that every team can work. Uh, smoothly as they are interacting with the system. So in your case, let's say when you had these rules, uh, do you want to touch a little bit on the process boundaries, how they were identified and what were the KPIs uh, that were relevant for each of these teams? Yeah, I mean, basically once the, so in this particular scenario, they obviously had, you know, customer journey maps. So uh, whether that was uh, lead scoring, that kind of triggered uh, the handoff between, um, you know, what would be the marketing team, if you will, uh, and customer service, and then customer service, uh, inside sales, customer service, kind of in this particular case, interchangeable, uh, interchangeable language there. Um, but it would get handed off typically to an internal salesperson uh, until again, it, it, it that particular prospect uh, met another target to be then handed off to the external sales team. Because in this particular case, external sales team was more of a regionalized sales team. Uh, so they didn't have uh, a lot of firepower in terms of, um, you know, in terms of, of that resource. So they really utilized kind of this team pooling method at the inside sales level. Uh, and then we're working to identify larger opportunities to kind of hand off uh, to the external sales team and, you know, obviously to try to uh, close those deals. So that was how it worked in this uh, particular scenario. So I would kind of break that up into to really three buckets uh, and a lead scoring process to kind of identify at which point those handoffs uh, happened. So when we talk about, you know, obviously the marketing um, architecture of things in this scenario is really their responsibility to just continually drive those inbound leads. And then once those leads reached a certain you know, certain KPI, certain metrics, certain lead score uh, based on their interactions throughout the architecture, it would then get moved to the next to the next uh, department. OK, amazing. Thank you so much, Dave, for that. So, Ken, I am actually going to move to you. So I don't know if you are going to change anything in this architecture, uh, whether you have any sort of agreement or disagreement with Dave, uh, or you can cover your story that you have uh, for marketing information architecture. 
Yeah, thanks, uh, Dave. That was great, by the way. Um, I'm going to start with maybe a little bit different um, uh, storytelling because what I really focus on at Hatch is humanizing digital experiences. Okay, so when I talk about the humans of a business, and especially, and I'll I'll tell the story through the lens of B two B manufacturers and B two B distributors. Okay, yeah. uh, when I talk about the people of a business, I'm talking about the employees. Always start there. Never ever ever for any CEOs out there, do not do what the Better.com guy did. Never do that. Take care of your people. Let me get that message out there. Uh, employees, customers, and candidates. Um, and, and what I'd like to do is think about what is that process of those people? What is important to them? And how do you back and how do you back into the processing of data that is collected that aligns to the, the process of the people of the business? And then that inherently leads to where does that data sit? And then how is that data accessed for different functional uses within corporations? So I was just kind of taking some notes and I was trying to think back um, to, I mean, just in your mind's eye, think about that funnel. Everyone's seen the funnel, right? Everyone's seen awareness, uh, interest, consideration, intent, buy, right? That graduation and sequence of a buyer. Yeah. Um, some of the concepts that Dave was talking about in, in regards to lead scoring, for instance, that inherently ties back to uh, whether it's a CRM, it's a marketing automation tool. So let's talk about the tech stack for a second. Yeah. Um, any solid marketing department is going to need a ver need data to be accessed from a variety of platforms in the stack. Yeah. Uh, ERP. I know a guy, Sam Gupta. Wink, wink. Uh, <laughs> near and dear to your heart. ERP, e-commerce, CRM, CMS. Uh, marketing automation, analytics. These are all platforms that go on the stack that every single marketer is going to need access to in order to paint the picture of how do I correlate value of marketing initiative to financial outcomes. When I talk about marketing, marketing is the tip of the sales spear. And that's it's a really critical point to make sure that you have the technologies in place, but most importantly, the right data sitting in the right locations to tell and weave those stories of, of which customers and contacts in your database are up the list or down the list for that qualifying business event. And I, I wanna talk, um, Talk, let's think about CRM for a second. Let's go deep on that platform, and, and then I'll, I'll pause, and maybe we can get some uh, some some volleys going back and forth. The basic premise of any CRM, right? Doesn't matter which label you put on it; they all have the same structure, if you will. And it's contacts, leads, opportunities, quotes, and sales. Okay. How those individuals get into that system based on the qualifying events that make them valuable enough to even go in that system, you're touching all those other platforms in the stack that I just said. On an offline engagement of a contact going on an e-commerce tool, visiting a trade show booth where you get your badge scanned, that's an interaction and a touch point between customer and brand. All of this information that is collected has to be relegated back into business use. And the business use of the data is to make sure that the, that the functions of the organization ranging sales and marketing and customer service, for instance, all have a concentric view of who this person is, what have they experienced in engaging with my brand, and over what time frame. And essentially, that's for the components of a lead scoring model. Profile of individual, engagement of that person, or, and over what time frame. Um, so I'll pause there to make sure we get some other uh, uh, air time for the rest of the, for the team members. But I want to talk a little bit more about what those tech stacks are, the needs of the customer, the process of a customer, and how that back in, in, into uh, meaningful business capabilities to translate that exchange of uh, behavior between customer and brand. All right, amazing. Thank you so much, Ken, for that. So I am going to move to Rick just in the interest of time so that everybody can get uh, the air time as well. So Rick, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if you want to address any of the comments that have been mentioned so far, uh, or you can share your story of the marketing ar architecture the way you like to see things. Uh, you are on mute, by the way. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to keep kind of building on the example and kind of go into different areas of the ar architecture. Um, I, I think most marketing teams, really the question depends on what kind of company you're at. Are, do, you have a direct, um, do you have direct channels where you're going to market with the end consumer 
around the customer directly, or are you going indirectly through uh, a B2B scenario where you're selling products to then your customers then selling your products. And so your marketing team has completely different functions in those operations. So if we stay with the B2B side for a second, as a marketer, your fundamental job is to add value to your sales team so that they can add the best value when they're in the field. <laughs> um, if you're not, if your sales team doesn't know enough about trends, uh, segments of what their consumers are doing. So your job is really, how do I know the cost, know my retail clients, for instance, if you're in, in retail, um, better than they even know themselves? Where are the holes in my assortment that I can fill? Um, you know, trends that are coming up. What, what should they be buying next year? Because a lot of times they're buying products six, 12 months out. And so as a result, that has to do with forecasting. And forecasting comes from what? Customer insights, segmentations, trends, whether they're in your industry or in the broader market. So things like knowledge management platforms, where you're taking data from industry analysts that are looking not only maybe from like retail POS data, maybe they're looking um, from analysts, either industry specific analysts or broader analysts. They're coalesce marketing teams are coalescing this knowledge into knowledge management platforms with its own category of software. Um, that software then has many different publishers. It could be publishers from consultants yep. or other people they have relationships with or analyst firms. But then the receivers of that data are all across the organizations. Line of business managers within your company receive yep. data that's been collated there from the team. Obviously, the sales team is a big uh, user of it um, no, a, as well. So that's that's sort of another you know asset. Uh, here, I think we had mentioned about assets, digital asset management systems. That, you know, I think are another uh, big data point. One that hasn't quite been brought up yet is is the idea of a data lake. Uh, there are sources of truth throughout your enterprise, whether they're your ERP system or they're all your customer touch points, whether it's a website, a B two B website that has to deal with some part of your customer journey, or an app, or a visit in a store. All that data thousands of data points collected all the time have to make it to some central source of truth where you can collate all these data and then analyze on top of it. So that architecture itself starts with source of truth. Yeah. There's some kind of uh, what's called an ETL layer or extract transform load. It's like, how do you get the data from the sort the systems and source of truth to these enterprise data lakes or data warehouse, depending on you know, kind of your level of scale. And then you have analysis tools that build on top of those things. So those are two other kind of, um, I'd say, angles to this problem that that uh, just to kind of keep the discussion moving forward. Yeah, so I am going to have one clarifying question for you related to the data lake and the analytics that you mentioned. Uh, and typically, there are going to be two use cases when you look for analyzing this data, you know, and really making decisions because of this data, right? So one use case could be that you are trying to automate some of these workflows and you are trying to trigger the actions based on the workflows and that insight need to be your sort of the operational, the workflow system that you might have. Uh, it could be your CRM, ERP, whichever system you, you have. Uh, and then you have obviously the data lake that is not really making any sort of uh, decisions uh, or any sort of, I mean, human is actually making, um, they are trying to do the study uh, on top of it, but it's not really part of either the automated workflow or as you are progressing through your transaction right inside your app. So typically from your experience, when marketers, let's say, if they are looking for analytics, for example, let's say, uh, you know, you want to send a bunch of emails from your, uh, if they have left out the shopping cart or something like that. Uh, where does that analytics reside typically? Is it going to be uh, in your data lake system or is it going to be uh, in your CRM system? So usually it starts in whatever tool is specific to that channel. Okay. Uh, and, and that's like you have a B2B commerce, you know, some kind of website. Usually there's some kind of marketing app, uh, automation platform that's tied into there yep. where the triggers and you know the pixels or however it's implemented is very specific to that platform and then you could actually do the automation kind of locally to that platform only in the case where you want to analyze across 
customer touch points. For instance, you have a marketer that wants to know how many people visit my website also walked into a store yesterday. Those are things that will not be in the silo tools. Yeah. And so I think it's at the level of analysis that you're you're looking at. And if you if you are an e-commerce marketer or a B2B website marketer, you're not going to necessarily need to go to a data lake to, to make a channel specific decision. But if you're going across multiple customer touch points, um, it, it, you, you may be required to. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Rick, for that. And Sarah, I'm actually come to you, uh, going to come to you. So you must be thinking that, you know what, uh, where is this discussion going? You guys are talking about ERP. Come on, marketers don't touch ERP. Where is the creativity? So, okay, so you started on a new job and obviously now you are trying to create your marketing uh, you know, department and you are the real testament of a user who is going to be needing a lot of different systems and the information. So what are different roles and the systems and the architecture that you have seen in your experience that marketers typically need? Yeah, so I want to start with kind of explaining how I describe marketing because I yeah. think it's really relevant to our discussion. Yeah. So to me, marketing is education at scale. So when someone is ready to buy, they think of your company. And I've had two very different experiences in my career running sales and marketing where I was at a company where they didn't really believe in marketing. And therefore, the marketing technology budget was basically zero. And I think that is more common than we think in some industries. Yep. And so in that situation, it was going about things in a very, very rational way to figure out what technology was really, really affordable yep. or free, which there's a lot of really awesome free marketing software out there that my team and I could implement that would actually have an impact and would actually be used. And I think there's a big challenge in the market with all of the new marketing technology out there. There's probably, if someone did a study, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 different solutions in the market yeah. by being able to figure out what is your team actually going to use and what's going to work within your budget. So that was that was one experience that I had in my career. And then I've had the opposite experience running marketing for a company that I think actually had too much technology. So there were so many different systems that I think we were spending more than we needed. The systems did not integrate and talk to each other and people weren't actually using a lot of the systems because they were too complicated they weren't very user friendly and in that scenario i think it's really important for somebody to step back and maybe that's using a third party consultant if you're too biased and too much in the weeds to really come in and look at what technology do we have what do we actually need and what sort of data and metrics are going to be important for us in the future? So I'll, I'll just pause there because I think those are two really, really common scenarios that I've lived through in um, as being a marketer who was responsible for actually the technology budget and executing and making sure that the data and systems and everything work together. So very interesting. And those were the stories where you didn't have a choice to create those departments and to bring the technology that you felt that are that is probably going to add real value. So now, let's say if you were to create your ideal organization, yeah, you have a little bit of budget, you know, you can bring whatever you want. So now what are going to be those technologies and the systems that you are going to create in your ideal marketing department? Yeah, so I think there's two things that are really important. And I'm speaking from a SaaS perspective. So I've okay. always run marketing for, for tech companies, small to mid-size. I think the first thing is you need to have some sort of CRM system yeah. 
okay. to track and manage the customer journey and the customer experience. And I think you need to have some automate marketing automation software. So some of the things that you're doing aren't always manual. So it's important. Those are two really important systems, and it's important that those systems are integrated and talk together. Now, I want to highlight something that I think is a big challenge for me um, and many of my friends that are marketers. And it's the fact that people rely too heavily on attribution software to track the data and metrics. And so let me give you an example. So on everything we do at my new company, I've added a field on every form that says, how did you hear about us? Hmm. It's a required field and it's an open field. And the purpose of having that field as a marketer is I want to hear from people how they heard about our company. Was it through speaking on Sam's show? Was it speaking on a specific podcast? Was it from a LinkedIn post? Was it from a tweet? And without having that information, I would say in my experience, 70 plus percent of the data that attribution software provides is not accurate. It's going to track something as a website lead or as coming in from Google. But if you actually ask that specific information, you're going to find out where people are actually hearing about your company. And therefore, as a marketer, you can figure out where to invest your time and resources because you know what's actually working. And the reason I'm mentioning that on a show today where we're talking about marketing software, I think sometimes you just need to use common sense yep. and make things a lot more simple than, than they are. And so stop relying so much on the data and metrics that we forget about what's really, really important as a marketer. Okay, could not agree more. And I am probably going to implement this on our site as well. And I'm probably going to ask you to send the information if you're getting any leads because of this show, because I would like to know that. Thank you so much, Sarah, for yeah, that. But I mean, after just implementing that at our company, I mean, I, I personally look at every single response that people type into our form, and I'm building out a database and tracking where people are actually hearing about us so I can then invest time and resources in those channels. That's very smart. I agree. All right, Robert. So I'm actually going to move to you next, uh, you know, for your stories, any agreement, disagreements in the room so far. Gee, I don't know if there's anything left for me to talk about. I mean, these guys are already covered some really great topics, but um, <clears throat> I love what everybody has said. Um, like Sarah is dead on. So many companies get caught up in the, the sparkly bauble, let me go buy the new toy. And they, they may not understand or may not fully implement it. And, you know, they leave existing technology behind, which would perfectly suit their needs. Um, I think people start doing management uh, recommendations or, you know, management advice du jour, KPIs du jour, and, and they, you know, it ends up being a hydra. And, you know, they're chasing too many tails and they, they really don't settle in on the thing that's really working for their company. You can't you can't go to your best friend who owns a, a, a different type of company and say, hey, you know, what are you tracking? It may not fit for your organization. So I think what you have to pick first is what are the most important things for you to track? Figure out, do you have actually capture and utilize the data that allows you to measure that and see you know, where, where that's going. Um, you know, from, for, from my story. So we, I was working at a company that was a B to B to C. And so we would market to the consumer, but the consumer would go to the other business and we implemented pearls, which is personalized URL for these consumers. They would, we would go to the, you know, they would go to that address. They would fill out the form. They would have a personalized offer for them. So what does that mean? What does it take to actually have that happen? Well, that means that you actually have to have some data on that customer, either 
from data that we had within our own organization or data that we purchased from a third party and integrated with our own data. So we could actually come up with personalized offers for all these consumers. And then we would have to pass that down to our partner organizations so they can make an informed decision on how they're working with them. What we did find being most valuable in that is setting up partner portals where the partner, instead of having a sales rep hit the customer over the head with buy this, maybe, maybe they don't want that. Maybe they don't need that at that time because you know some sales reps don't understand where that company is at that particular time because they're not sharing the data. So if you can take a look at the, the information that you have on that organization, um, you could actually, AI will do this pretty well. There, there's some nice tools out there that will do it from an AI perspective. It, analyze the habits of that buying customer and, fee, and and match them to similar customers, kind of like what Amazon does. You buy this product, many people that buy this product also buy B and C. So you, that, that's an offer that you can put in their partner portal. So when they come in, they log into the partner portal and say, hey, we see that you bought this stuff. Here's a personalized offer for you. You buy this. Taking that out of the sales rep's hands, not to take the sale away from them, but to use them for more strategic sales opportunities. Um, and then they can also go in there and see what their history is as opposed to having to go through all their invoices you know, it just makes it a lot simpler for them to do business with you. And it just saves a lot of time and saves a lot of marketing effort. So you can actually work on the more, the more fruitful strategic initiatives. So that was, that's our story. Okay, amazing. So I am going to have one follow-up question for you as well, since you mentioned the, the partner portal and the partner uh, sort of the marketing stack. And especially when you talk about these, uh, you know, uh, B2B versus B2C organization. So here, my assumption is going to be that the partner portal that you are talking about, this is probably a B2B organization. Uh, so how was this organization structured overall from the segmentation between B2B and B2C? Because in your case, you mentioned that this is B2B to C. Uh, so I don't know if those business models were mixed uh, as part of your story. Uh, do you want to talk about the segmentation between B2B and B2C inside one department? So... <clears throat> We had an extensive sales rep organization across the country for the okay. products and we didn't want to step on their feet. So we weren't selling directly to the consumer. We would go through from licensing perspectives because it was a, um, a regulated market. We would go through the representatives and the representatives would sell it. So the representatives, the, the consumer had to go to the representative. So if the consumer ever came up to us directly, we could refer them to that lo to local sales reps that they could choose from. If they want, they couldn't purchase from us directly, but at least it's a way for us to hand off to that. And we have the ability to automate that or, or manually do that depending on um, lead scoring for that particular and, and follow through for that particular representative. So representatives that had sold a lot of business for us, we would give them more leads. And and so we would, you know, that, that was one thing that we tracked for them in terms of, you know, what the... The partner portal, when they would log in, they could actually see all of the business that they had done with us, you know, the new things that are coming up, yeah. give them all the information, all the training, everything um, that would actually make doing business with us simpler, faster, and less expensive. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Robert, for that. So, uh, Dave, I'm actually going to come back to you so we can do one more segment, and that is going to be... Just overall, uh, you know, from the structure of the marketing department. So one of the variable always is going to be that, okay, B2C marketing departments or the architecture are going to be very different from your B2B marketing architecture. And this is also driven by the deal size in my experience. Uh, the higher the deal size is, uh, the different your marketing cycle and the sales cycle is going to be. Uh, so typically from your experience, when you look at different, uh, you know, either marketing architecture or the different marketing organization, what are some of the variables? And if you can talk about the differences of those, uh, that'll be amazing. Yeah. Um, before I jump into that, I just wanted to touch on a couple of things that uh, the rest of the panel threw out there, which I thought was really great. Um, you know, Sarah, with what you had brought up, I really love that with your change in terms of adding that to the forms that you have that you left it as an open field because too often i feel like 
you know, when it's a drop down and it doesn't necessarily make sense or it's a checkbox and it doesn't necessarily make sense, you can lose somebody there. But the fact that you're leaving it as an open field and then you're going to do the data aggregation and, um, you know, really kind of dive deep into that, I think that's going to be super powerful over the long term. I think that's something that uh, definitely we should highlight here uh, for the rest of the rest of the people that are listening. And David, um, one note on that. Um, yeah. It, I've seen com several companies have it as a drop down and it's biased and then it's not accurate information because you're forcing them to choose versus giving an open text field where you can write extensive detail and information. And it's important that that field is required. Do not make it optional. Yeah, no, I, I really love that. I, I think it makes a makes a ton of sense. And Robert, you said something that really stood out to me as well in terms of, um, you know, picking what you want to measure, right? One of my favorite kind of uh, KPIs for marketing and sales is how many leads have we generated, right? Because it's a great lead metric instead of a lag metric. So not what's already happened in terms of what we've, you know, what we've sold for the day or for the week, for the month, but what do we have on the inbound side? And that should give you some good indication of, you know, what future sales are going to be. So I thought those were a couple of really, really smart points and, and everybody else uh, had some really good stuff too. So um, Sam, back to your question in terms of kind of differences between the B2C and B2B architecture. Uh, in my experience, and you kind of already touched on this, I'll just talk a little bit further about it. Typically in the B2C environment, the deal sizes are going to be smaller and a lot more transactions. Yeah. So typically in that environment, you're not going to have what you would find is as compared right to a B2B, let's say CRM solution, because you've got a lot of churn of customers and you don't have typically as long of a buying cycle or, or as long a, of a customer journey. So kind of what's the point, right? Uh, as composed to, or as compared to the B2B side, where you would definitely want to get your prospects put into that CRM and understand all of the different touch points that are happening throughout all of the inbound channels, throughout all of the, you know, the different interactions. And, you know, one thing we haven't talked about uh, yet, but, you know, I always like to talk about it because it's part of my background, but how the digital and physical world come yeah. together, right? Yeah. So we're talking about digital marketing here, but let's not forget all of the traditional channels that are still out there and utilized and how we take that, those touch points, right? And those connections and get that into the digital world. We need to still be able to put that information into a CRM. So that way, you know, again, back to what Robert brought up about the pearls, let's say, how you can start to connect all of those dots and really build an experience um, you know, for your uh, ideal client, right? Build the experience, build the education and really talk to them where they're at in the journey. So that way back to, again, Sarah's point of, you know, that's really what we're trying to do is educate people and get them to remember us if and when they're ready to make a purchase. So thank and, you. And David, you, I would throw in there, you mentioned um, about events and more traditional. I would say that most marketing departments waste a significant amount of money on trade shows and events, outrageous amounts of money where there's no revenue generation. They're just trying to capture leads. But yeah. if the leads don't convert into customers and don't convert into revenue, it's a huge, huge waste of money for a marketing department. I got to jump in on that, Sarah. Yeah, I'm sorry. 100% agree. <laughs> There is a big difference of a lead at a trade show. Just because you put your business card in the fishbowl to win a free T-shirt, that does not make you a lead. I love the, the people that run around and scan as many badges as possible because their quota is tied to how many leads they scan at the show. I, can just, I see them running around. Yeah. In, in my experience, the real miss with all of that is the lack of collaboration between marketing sales and you know leadership 
right? So exactly what you guys are talking about, making sure that we define what does a good lead look like? And in my experience, just going to a trade show, that might not be the best go-to-market strategy for you. Maybe it is attending the show, but getting a, you know, let's say hotel suite or something and hosting a, a private uh, event for 25 of your, you know, top prospects and, and bringing in a speaker or something. There's all kinds of different approaches for that. But from my perspective and experience, the biggest miss is because it's a lack of collaboration. You've got a siloed set of departments who are getting graded on metrics like, hey, how many trade show leads did you get? I got 500. Well, hallelujah, because you know what? You just killed it. So good job for you. All right. Amazing, Dave. Uh, so, Ken, I'm actually going to move to you. Uh, you know, differences between b 2 c and B2B uh, marketing architecture, if you have any insights there. Uh, yeah, for sure. So, so why don't we stay on the B2B side because we're getting a lot of momentum going there. Um, so when we talk about what, what is a meaningful business value, obviously it translates back to sales. What's mm -hmm. the, ne the next best thing to a sale is a lead. How do you capture those leads? We've talked about a lot of different things from uh, attribution. Uh, we're talking about BI. We're talking about data lakes. We're talking about a lot of these different underlying technologies that collectively paint that picture of, of who is most meaningful in the pipeline to drive revenue and profitability within the organization. B2B challenges, the biggest one that I've seen firsthand is that the largest hurdle to overcome is this lack of understanding or, or, or experience in what digital is. So someone made the comment previously about the amount of, of um, uh, budget that, that is spent on trade shows. Why do they do that? That's what they're familiar with. That's what they've always done. That's what worked in 2008. Sure. And what I found really interesting in, in this digital space, when we talk about lead generation through traditional channels, such as trade shows, for instance, when we talk about in the digital space, it all comes back to, yeah, but how much is it worth? How much is it worth? Those questions aren't being asked traditionally through channels of trade shows, for instance. How much budget is really spent when you're talking about T&E expenses, booth creation, booth design, right? These are all expenses that has to get calculated into calculating a true ROI. So I think this is a really important distinction because on the B2C side, you don't have that same kind of challenge that has to be overcome. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Ken, for that. So I am actually going to move to uh, Rick next. And Rick, obviously, I'm pretty sure you are going to be addressing this challenge from the B2C perspective, uh, because you do a lot of work in the B2C space. Uh, so do you feel that uh, you don't have similar challenges or you have more challenges uh, in the B2B side? Do you want to address that? Yeah, it's interesting. I'll, I'll make one quick comment on the B2B side, I would say. You know, if you're if you're in sales, there are only two types of leads you get: either bad leads or no leads. Um, and and so the marketing people don't get any help there. Um, on, on the B to B to C side, I, I would say, um, really, what you're talking about overall is direct response yeah. in all of its forms across all the channels that you have. The key to direct response, and and the key reason it fails is bad content. And so if your content is bad, it's not relevant, wrong wrong audience wrong message uh, at the wrong time. And so if your content is bad, usually that goes back upstream and it has, that has to do with people process technology upstream from there. And so if you think about your content factory, you think about product information management, what do you have about your, what do you know about your product? Half the time you have marketing teams that don't know anything about the products because they're not experts on the products. So how, do you, how are you gonna design a good message if you don't know anything about your products, you're not working with, the, your your manufacturer or your product your product team um, for what's going on that's that's kind of number one. Second is like having your digital assets at the same time you have your product assets and that's synchronized with your campaigns. Even that just sort of simple flywheel always gets out of whack because what takes the longest to produce? Well, the more complex assets like your your videos and your your photo shoots and all those things typing attributes into a form about a product that might be bullet points that always is you know takes um less time and so that's all things that happen the marketing team isn't necessarily responsible for literally typing in and producing all that data but the marketing marketing team is sometimes the downstream uh i'll, I'll use a generous word beneficiary 
of, of great, uh, great or bad content that they can then use for the campaigns. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Rick, for that. Uh, Sarah, uh, so I'm actually going to come to you. Uh, your opinion uh, in terms of uh, B2B versus B2C marketing architecture. So I've never worked in B2C. So what I'm going to say is just um, B2B focused. So typically in a, in a B2B SaaS company, the model is marketing is responsible for generating inbound. Those leads that come in are then passed off to a BDR team, yeah. which is a team that uses um, email, text message, um, phone technology to qualify to say, is this actually a good lead? And does this fit into our ideal customer profile? After the BDR has vetted the lead, assuming it's something that's qualified, it will then get passed off to a sales rep whose job is then to work the deal and close the deal. So that's a traditional SaaS model, marketing to BDR to sales. And I think a disconnect that happens at a lot of SaaS companies is that marketing and sales clash and they don't necessarily like working together. And that's a, a huge, huge disadvantage for the company. Because in my opinion, good marketers educate the market with great content. So the buyers have that information and they reach out to the company when they're ready to, um, to buy. And so marketing should be generating qualified leads that are further along in the process that are more ready to buy, which then get handed off to sales to then close. So I think it's really important that whatever technology that you buy at your company is something that sales and marketing can use to collaborate and work together. So the outbound, the inbound, and all the data is centralized so you can work unified together as a team. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that. So Robert, I'm actually going to come to you. Uh, your opinion in terms of B2B versus B2C marketing architecture or if you want to address any of the comments that have been mentioned so far. Yeah, so I, I've been in both, and I'm going to touch on something that both Rick and Sarah said. First and foremost, you need to know the product inside and out. Yep. And you, when I say that, I've actually been at a company where the development team who was designing and building the product refused categorically to train, teach, or provide documentation to the support organization or the sales organization. So they were left to their own devices to figure out how it worked, what the changes were, so they could communicate that to the customers. That, <laughs> and I was head of support for that company. And I, I was dumbfounded and, and in the president's office pretty much every week trying to, to break that mold. Um, if you don't know the product and how it interacts with everything else within your family and what the path is for that product. So let's say that you're a beginning customer and you've only got the first module and then you're growing. What module comes next and why? What will it work with and what will it not? So being a well-informed um, sales representative of your products and the product family to help the customer to train and teach them, be educational, that's going to improve the customer experience. Um, and then, you know, talking about how the customer moves through. So the, the, if, if I take a step back and, you know, the differences between B2B and B2C, so those two are the same across. You got to know your product. In the B2C, it's, it's more mass. You're doing a lot of media buying, you know, you, so you're going to go buy a bunch of, uh, you know, ads on, let's say, YouTube and broadcast and, um, you know, maybe you're going to be doing some email campaigns and some SMS campaigns, but you're driving them somewhere. Here's where both B2B and B2C sometimes need help. The technology sometimes advances faster than the marketing team can keep up with it. And some organizations are structured in such a way that the marketing team wants to move faster, but they have to wait for the technology team to be available to say, provide that landing page. So many marketing teams that I've worked with 
actually go off on their own and use separate tools outside of the architecture of the organization so they can create those landing pages so they can move at the speed of business as opposed to the speed of their IT department. Just something to keep in mind. Robert, one thing you mentioned that it's so important to know the product, I would also ar argue that it's just as or more important to know your customer. Yep. It is shocking to me how many marketers I speak to never talk to their customers. How in the world are you supposed to create content and educate the market if you don't talk to your customers? You're absolutely right. There's so many organizations that have, say, never heard of NPS scores. Um, you know, they, they don't know what it is. They don't care. They don't have voice to the customers. They don't interview their customers. They don't understand what a customer journey is. A lot of people these days are talking about customer journey. Yeah. There are still organizations out there that have never done one. And it's it's like speaking Russian to them and they just, they have no clue what you're talking about. And you're absolutely right. If you don't understand who your customer is, why they've chosen to come to you, why they're looking at your product, how can you help them? Why, why are you the differentiator versus all your competition for that particular customer? If you don't know that, then I always what are you doing? argue that great marketers should always be customer obsessed. And it's not only understanding your customer, but it's understanding the market and being in front of thought leaders and influencers and people that you're selling to all of the time to pick up on trends, what's happening in the market, so you don't get passed by. Yep. And this is a critical piece of the conversation too, because when we're talking about product development, how many times have we seen in the industrial space products get created without any information that is typically held by marketing and run by marketing? I've seen ex examples where they might, where engineers who are brilliant in individuals can create a product out of stainless steel. That's fantastic that you can accomplish that. If customers don't care, what's the point? Well, I, I think you nailed it right there letting engineers design something that consumers are going to use without having anybody in between. That's, That's right. it's not to say that they're not a great engineer, but because they have been dealing with the product for so long, they understand it intimately. Mm -hmm. They, they are going to know the ins and outs. And if you hand it to a new customer, they're going to look at it like, what is this? What do I do with it? I'm completely confused. The other thing I think that's really important when we're talking about marketing technology is understanding the buyer's journey today, not the buyer's journey from 2008. Yep. And if you were to ask me, Sarah, when you buy an, when you're going out to the market for something new, what is your buying process? The number one thing I do is go ask my peers. The number two thing I'm going to do is go into community groups and make a post and get feedback from people. So if your marketing technology that you're using is considered spamming people and producing gated content that nobody has time to get access to, you're completely missing the mark about how people buy today. So often, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I think so often executives who are really removed from the customers because their role is completely different. You know, that they just have a completely different focus. They will make a decision that is not customer based. It's based on their own feelings. And it really doesn't matter what I feel. It matters what the customer does. So how, how many of you have heard people say, oh, TikTok is useless. What, what are we even thinking about? Some of your customers are going to be there. You need to be where the customer chooses to consume, not where you choose to publish. Fish where the fish are. Yep. Uh, Rick, Rick, you had a comment, right? Uh, Rick? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, one of the things that, that Sarah and Robert are hitting on is kind of, you know, I, I'm hearing it called, called a, like almost dark social. You know, these, these communities of peer groups that are cross company where people come together and collaborate and learn from their peers. And it could be online, it could be Slack communities, it could be in Discord, depending on your industry, it could be all over the place. But if your content isn't shareable, it isn't bite-sized enough to be useful. Um, and so that, that I, I always take a little bit of issue with the sales team that believes that marketing is about sales enablement, meaning like serving me up on a lead that I don't have to think about. 
I mean, to me, the number one goal of marketing is really three things. Like you, you, you need to make sure that your companies and products are known, liked, and trusted. And if you can do that, marketing has already like 80% of the way there. Forget about the lead because somebody's going to get in touch with them. They're going to learn about you in the space. And even if the sales rep finds them on their own, it's like, oh, you've heard about us. How do you think that happened, Mr. Sales Rep? It didn't happen on its own. Marketing still did its job, even though it didn't generate that lead. And so that's, I think that's a, that's a little bit of a, a slippery slope where you get in. It's like, well, I missed my MQLs this week, but I really, um, um, I, I'm still doing what I'm here for. Marketing's job is to make sales easier. And you know, the definition, we're talking about definitions between marketing and inside sales. Marketing's job is not to just hand over, okay, just go cut a PO. That's not what marketing's role is. Inside sales should be the ones that are qualifying deeper qualification of leads that are identified, passing over to sales because it's a sales function. Now, I want to hit on something that, that Rick said, trusted. It's huge. So I, I got a great story. So we were buying from a vendor and we would get it into the warehouse. Customers would buy it. it. It was, we were like the number two seller in the country of this particular product. They were flying out the shelf. I mean, we couldn't get them in fast enough. 30% of them were coming back. They said, the instructions aren't right on the box. I can't do what the instructions are saying. It, it, you know, the item doesn't work the way it's supposed to work. So I, I actually looked at the instructions they wanted the customer, so this is the way it came from the factory. So it was actually shipped from the factory in China to us directly. So they wanted the customer to actually open this item out, take packing material that was actually inserted inside the item, take that out, and then close the item back up again so that they could use it appropriately. And customers were just literally opening the bag ignoring the instructions, trying to play it, not even knowing that the packing material is in there and thinking that it was broken and they were sending it back to us. And then I looked in the box and the box didn't even accurately represent what was inside of it. It apparently was an old picture. And so they thought that we were doing a bait and switch on them. And so I called up the manufacturer, the, the, the brand. I said, what are you doing guys? 30% of these are coming back because you know, you slap these instructions on the outside with scotch tape, thinking the customer is going to pay attention to it. Who designed this packing system? Who, who didn't change the image to accurately reflect what was on the box? We are losing customer trust because they think that we, the, you know, the end seller, are trying to sell them a, a bad product or a product that's already been sold before when actually it was manufacturing. All right, guys, so we are going to close. Uh, the only thing we can take at this point of time is going to be super, super short closing advice, maybe a couple of words, not more than that. Uh, so Dave, I am going to start with you. Just a few words, please. Yeah. Collaborate. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Dave. Love it. Uh, Ken, super short closing advice. Build your business requirements around the needs of the people of your business. Okay, love it. Thank you so much, Ken. Uh, Rick, closing advice, please. Yeah, I, I would say get out of your silo and walk around and talk to your colleagues. Awesome. Love it. Uh, Sarah, closing advice, please. Less is more. Love it. Uh, Robert, closing advice, please. Actually talk to your customers. Okay. Love it, guys. So that's it for today. If you join for the first time, this was part of our digital transformation series for which we meet every Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. We pick one topic related to digital transformation, and we always have one panel uh, that is willing to share their insights and wisdom. This was our last panel for the year. We are not going to be doing any more panels for this year. We are going to come back uh, next year, uh, mid-January. So we are not going to be here next week, but stay tuned for next year's episode. They are going to be so exciting. On that note, I really want to thank everybody for your time and insights today. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.